Good morning, everyone. It's so great to, uh, to see you all here this morning. I'm glad we have a little bit of a crowd. I really appreciate you being here this morning when there are so many other things you could be doing, say, watching a coronation of a king <laughs> or you know, spending a beautiful morning walking on the Charles, spending time with your children. So thank you for joining us instead. Um, I actually think it stands as testimony to the importance and the success of this conference that you're all here. And I know we have a crowd joining us virtually as well. My name is Carrie James. I am a principal investigator at a research center called Project Zero, which is three floors up from here. Um, it's been a long-standing center here at the Ed School. I also work directing research at the SAFRA Center's Democratic Knowledge Project, so a couple of different hats. Um, but I spend the majority of my work time and energy exploring adolescents' digital lives, their lives behind their screens. So the topic of this morning's session is super relevant to my interests. Our goal this morning is to give focused attention to the ways that digital technologies are being used by schools and the corresponding implications, opportunities, as well as risks for students in particular. And we're going to talk mostly about K through 12 education. Higher ed may come up, but I think that that's going to be our main focus. As we enter into any kind of discussion, any kind of research or policy making, decision making about technology, we face a really hard reality. And late yesterday afternoon in the, in the last panel of the day, Ashley Lee teed this up. It's the reality that technology is a moving target. So keeping up is extremely difficult. And it feels especially hard at this particular moment with AI evolving so rapidly. So chat GPT is foremost on most people's minds lately. And when it comes to classrooms and schools, we're particularly worried about things like academic integrity. Chat GPT is important, and so are questions about academic integrity. But there are a whole host of other AI technologies, algorithmic systems, monitoring systems, that schools use in various ways to assign students into different schools or districts, to track them academically, to flag students at risk for dropping out, to monitor student activity, even their eye movements and facial expressions while taking a test, or for school safety purposes, predicting students who might be at risk for committing violence. So these uses can be really positive, but they also tee up deep ethical questions and concerns about misinterpretation of data, misuses of data. They also tee up questions about the very design of technologies, the biases that are programmed into them, and their impact short term and long term on students' outcomes in their very lives. We are fortunate to have a fabulous panel of experts who can help us interrogate different features of this problem space. And I hope propose some directions for thinking about ethical ed tech. I want to briefly introduce folks, but I'm not going to do that by naming their titles and their institutions, because you can read those in the program. Uh, rather, what I want to do is flag up features of their biographies that captured my attention as especially relevant to the conversation we're going to have this morning. So Sarah Igo is a historian and author of a book with the intriguing title of The Known Citizen, A History of Privacy in Modern America. So I'm sure you can imagine the connections to our topic for today. Sarah will be speaking first. Tierra Shante Tanksley has been a force in critical race technology theory in education, a framework that exposes the centrality of algorithmic racism in school-based technologies. Her work is deeply interdisciplinary and focused on the socio-technical experiences of black students. Benjamin Harold is a journalist who covers learning environments and ed tech issues for Education Week. And he's the author of the forthcoming book, Disillusioned, Five Families and the Unraveling of America's Suburbs. 
and Elizabeth Laird does work that engages civic institutions to promote responsible, equitable use of data and technology to improve outcomes for individuals and the public good, while at the same time ensuring it doesn't come at the expense of privacy and civil rights. Tricky balance, so I'm hoping Elizabeth will give us some <laughs> solutions. Just a small, a small request. So now that I've shared some of that, I hope you're keen, as keen as I am to hear from these experts. So I'm gonna invite Sarah up to get us started. Great, thank you. Um, to Carrie, this is working okay? Yes, fantastic. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Carrie, and for uh, wrangling us all. Uh, and I wanna thank um, the organizers, of course, of the conference, Liz Block, um, and of course, Mira, uh, for the wonderful gathering that we've had over the last day or so, uh, and also for inviting me uh, to be part of it uh, three years later. <laughs> Um, so this is a big topic we have uh, before us, uh, and it's an especially big topic to take on in about eight minutes. Uh, so I'm really glad that I'm not alone up here. And I'm gonna offer a particular perspective. It's the perspective of a historian um, who's worked on shifting debates over privacy in the United States over the last century and more. And so the first thing I'm gonna underscore um, is that, um, and I, I'll say this is predictable for a historian and perhaps even annoying, <laughs> is um, that none of the issues uh, that this panel is going to take up are new. Uh, this includes uh, surveillance of students, it includes the problematic nature of data collected about them, uh, the role of commercial educational technologies in the classroom, the data capture made possible, uh, through personalized, in quotes, uh, learning, or the effects of such practices on students' subjectivities. Each of these uh, things has a history, and sometimes a long history. Um, so let's see if I can, uh, it does not look like my slide, nope. Huh. Uh, I wish I could talk about multiple values and priority setting, but I can't. Um, shall I keep uh, clicking through? Okay. Hmm. Now we have a sneak preview of another panel. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll step us. It's the wrong uh, deck, I think. Yeah. all one deck, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that belongs to any of us, okay. Yeah, that's not part of, I don't think it's. Can you talk about one. refugee education? Okay. <laughs> Yesterday, I emailed Liz this morning with the full. Sorry. Do you want, Mira, do you want me to just keep on song slides? Is that Should I do that? Okay. Is that okay? I'll say, I think we should just, since we started late, and given this, why don't we take this panel to go till 10.30, and we'll be able to break. So yeah, is, is it going to be totally off if you talk? Uh, there will be some things maybe that won't quite jive, but that's, I think that's okay. okay. I mean, unless you, I, I'm yeah, up no, to you. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, if you're comfortable continuing to talk, and I'm sure that you're in contact with you. Yeah, I'm going to search our folder, too, and okay. see if they're in there. Thanks. Okay, so, so what you shall imagine up on the screen is a, uh, a book from 1964, which is where I thought I'd start. Um, I thought I would begin with the special critic, Vance Packer, okay. uh, who wrote a great book. Yeah, right, I think now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Yeah. Okay, okay, I think it just got it switched off. Okay, all right, here we go. Vance Packard, uh, 1964, um, is just, uh, one could begin in many places, but I'll start with him. Uh, here's what he wrote nearly a half century ago. The surveillance of students and the invasion of the privacy of their thoughts, anxieties, opinions, and home life have in some areas reached disturbing proportions. 
Um, and it was interesting, Packard, and I would show you this if I could, uh, Packard wrote not only about the surveillance of students, but he wrote about the increasing surveillance of teachers as well. Uh, and interestingly, he argued that this surveillance was rooted in an attempt to manage greater numbers of students with fewer resources. It's up. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Crack team here. Uh, I appreciate it. So now you can see that, I think, chapters uh, seven and eight there. Uh, Packard argued that this surveillance was rooted, as I said, um, in an attempt to manage greater numbers of students uh, with smaller numbers of resources. Sorry, the clicker's not going to work, so when you want the next slide, just say next slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Saturday morning. Here we go. Um, Packard said that it was the siren song of efficiency that appealed to administrators who were lured uh, toward modern surveillance techniques, modern for 1964 anyway, uh, for what they believed to be quote unquote worthy educational purposes. So this might all sound familiar. Um, oh, and next slide please, there we go. Uh, to take another example, and here are just a couple of images from the archive of EdTech. Uh, we worry today about new digital platforms at school, uh, the free Chromebook, uh, Google, Google Classroom, and others, uh, and the highly individualized tracking that they allow. But the goal is old, uh, with new technologies often touted as the answer to what ails American schools, uh, starting, as Paula Fass mentioned yesterday, with film all the way back in the 1930s. Uh, moving pictures, it was thought, uh, along with an array of other um, screen technologies, could work on students in a way that was much more powerful than textbooks. One educator in 1935 likened the effect of film on students' minds to, quote, the pressure of a finger upon a soft ball of clay. This same impulse uh, would lead to the introduction of commercial television in schools in the mid-century, and then uh, personal computers, uh, which promised personalized learning trajectories, um, and to interactive games that some of us might remember, like the Oregon Trail and Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, and so forth, um, by the 1980s. From there, we moved to tablets, watches, and phones, to online learning management systems, and the virtual school districts of our own time. As Victoria Kane notes in her uh, really marvelous book, Schools and Screens, time and time again, uh, technologies came not just with the promise of cost effectiveness or teaching at scale, uh, they made claims to address persistent inequities uh, between students too. Now, this didn't bear out, but the technologies uh, proceeded. Um, there are other patterns you can spy looking back to the 1970s, a pattern of outsourcing teaching via contracts with commercial vendors, which, as Kane again notes, often dovetailed with uh, spiking distrust in teachers, and it paved the way for a rash of uh, privacy concerns in schools. So, so far, I've only uh, gestured to issues that new technologies raised in the uh, curricular arena. But as Carrie has already mentioned, um, new technologies have also been long marshaled uh, to know and police students outside of the classroom as well. Um, and next slide here, please. Uh, here we might think um, of the movement of psychological tests and instrumentation into schools um, in the mid 20th century to better know and respond uh, to the whole student. Tests like these, and you can see one over here uh, that was uh, conducted on first graders, uh, students whose drawings were uh, then analyzed to understand their personalities. Tests like these would spark uh, a great deal of interest and also uh, organize protests uh, from parents uh, and others uh, by the mid to late 1950s. Uh, they asked questions about how much uh, schools had a right to know about students uh, and whether psychological instruments violated the privacy of the family and the home. It would lead to congressional investigations and even instances of uh, test burning in some schools. Uh, one instance um, uh, that I came across was a school district burning 5,000 socio-psychometric tests uh, that had diligently been filled out by ninth graders. So it's not too hard, I think, to see the connection uh, between this uh, instance of uh, intrusion, psychological intrusion, to recent debates about for-profit companies uh, like Gaggle or Social Sentinel, uh, which in a response uh, to the epidemic of school shootings, cyberbullying, and mental illness uh, cropped up to scan student emails and communications in the name of monitoring potential violence, self-harm, and other ills. 
uh, Gaggle advertised itself uh, as having the potential to, quote, stop tragedies with real-time content analysis. Now, just to turn to one more issue, uh, the political question of um, collecting and maintaining data on students arrived soon after in the public sphere. Uh, this was really in the mid-1960s and into the early 1970s, and it was part of, and here, a next slide, please, uh, a larger uh, public outcry about the power of computerized data systems in American society, and especially the data bank, and you see a couple of instances here. Uh, student records kept by schools uh, were a flashpoint in this debate. Um, the um, reckoning uh, around student records uh, came out of a, uh, a consciousness about the fact that much information in student files was inaccurate or biased, it was unaccountable to anyone, uh, and acted often as a secret gatekeeper, uh, structuring the life chances of children. Uh, and so, uh, through a, uh, a combination of grassroots and organized um, uh, advocacy by the Children's Defense Fund and others, there was a call to pry open those records and to create new rights uh, for the quote-unquote record subject. Next slide, please, and this is the last one. Uh, this is the uh, movement that would give us FERPA, now about 50 years old, almost exactly 50 years old, actually. So I don't offer this quick historical tour uh, in order to quiet alarms about the brave new digital world that we're in, uh, nor is my point that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there are novel dimensions uh, to each of these concerns about technological interfaces, uh, behavioral and academic tracking, psychological invasion, and their combined effects on the developing child. Some of these concerns, indeed, uh, have become clearer and more urgent in the three years between the original scheduling of this conference and now. And I'm just going to list three. Uh, one, the increasingly powerful uh, integration of digital technologies and young people's identities. Uh, secondly, the growing force of corporate designs and structuring what happens in classrooms. And third, at the same time, the less visible, and I would say deliberately less visible, intrusion they constitute. The intrusion no longer comes in the form of a psychologist marching in with a, a questionnaire in class, uh, but um, through the seamless automated logic of a proprietary platform. Um, so this is a difference, I think. It's worth noting that we've had time as educators and as a society to think about these problems. They've been recognized and debated, but also pushed aside, lobbied against, and ignored. And in part, it's this history that shapes our sense of what is possible uh, in our policy, our laws, our citizen actions, and our norms. Uh, I think this tells us something about our collective commitment or lack of commitment to reckoning with the social and ethical dilemmas technologies, old and new, have raised. Um, and let me just close by saying that the big questions before us, and they are ethical questions, I think, are old and new. What can and should we know about students and to what end? What happens to the troves of accumulated and sensitive information we gather about them? And even more central to our purposes here, what exactly is being taught by this crash course in digital surveillance? Thank you very much. Oh, on? Okay, cool. Perfect. Hi, y'all. I'm Dr. Tier Tanksley. I'm at CU Boulder. I'm an assistant professor of equity, diversity, and justice in education. Um, and my research really focuses on, as was previously mentioned, algorithmic anti-blackness. Next slide. So in general, my work crosses three dimensions. I just want to quickly kind of capture what I look at. Um, so this top image is taken from a breaking news story in 2020 that's featured um, a young black girl in high school who was incarcerated when a judge found out that she did not complete her remote homework. Um, and so this aspect of my work looks at the um, increasing presence of the new Jim Crow vis-a-vis -vis the new Jim Code, right? How e technologies really are facilitating the school-to-prison pipeline. This image on the 
bottom left is of Black Lives Matter, which my dissertation research focused on how hashtag activism produced a lot of positives, but also had some perils associated with it, particularly around viral images of black death and dying, which I'll be talking about today. And then this other image is of a young student. Um, this case went viral maybe five to 10 years ago. Um, a student brought a disassembled clock to school to show his science teacher, and he was arrested on campus because they assumed it was a bomb. And so this is my research in STEM inequity and how, again, we see how these uh, the influx of technology into our schools under the guise of equity, of you know closing the digital divide, of STEM progress is actually, again, um, one of the ways that we force students not only out of schools but into the criminal injustice system. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to take you through my dissertation study first. I'm going to show two studies today. Um, and the first study I did was really examining the effects of algorithmic anti-blackness outside of school. Next slide. So I'm not going to go over all these statistics, but essentially my research found that black girls were um, leading the way when it comes to digital technology broadly, but also on social media, right? A lot of our major movements are led by young black girls. They have some of the highest rates of social media use, um, and their posts are predominantly about race and racism. Next slide. Um, and while there was this majoritarian narrative about how social media was so democratic, it was so progressive, you know, it was able to materialize tangible, transformative change right, offline, there was simultaneously a pervasive amount of digital black death and dying. And so these are just some of the statistics I cannot see this font, but I'm going to try to remember off the top of my head. Uh, George Floyd's video went viral, um, and his nine-minute death video was viewed over 2.4 billion times. Uh, Philando Castile, when he was murdered, his partner actually live-streamed the footage, um, and that footage went viral um, and had several million views. 2.4 million, thank you. <laughs> My contacts need an update. Um, and when Tyree Nichols was murdered this January, actually there was this big countdown to the, to the release of the body cam footage, right? Um, and so in thinking about how pervasive black death was online, I was really interested in how are black students who are leading social media movements, how are they experiencing this? What are, what are the mental health consequences? What are the educational overlaps? Next slide. And my research study found these three main findings. First of all, one of the per most prominent um, terms used in my study was PTSD, that the black girls in my study felt like they were being traumatized by these images. Um, the second is digital harassment. Many of them were posting you know, um, in support of Black Lives Matter. They were saying, we need to defund the police. And as a result, they were getting hundreds of thousands of messages, right? sometimes by bots, um, threatening to lynch them, um, doxing their addresses, right? Um, they were constantly facing this onslaught of anti-black racism and weren't able to actually use the algorithmic systems in place to protect themselves. So when they would report hate speech, the algorithm would say, this is actually not hate speech um, according to our policies. So they would just have to essentially log off in order to survive these instances. And then finally, okay. <laughs> and then finally, um, there were educational overlaps, right? So students were experiencing um, disassociation, they had headaches, um, and they weren't able to participate in class. And I essentially found that anti-blackness, particularly black death and dying, did not go viral on accident. It's actually the organizing logic of a lot of our digital information systems. This is a content moderation policy by Facebook at the time, which trains its uh, human content moderators, but also its algorithms. And as you can see, they only protect white men. They do not protect black children. Um, these are some of the most prominent. Google announced in 2020 that its most highly searched term um, had to do with Black Lives Matter. And when I disaggregated the data, I found that all of the highest searched terms had to do with black men dead and dying. So in this image is Trayvon Martin, and you can see the related queries all have to do with death and dying, that they wanted to see the video, they wanted to see the autopsy, et cetera. And the final image is about click rate. So I talked about George Floyd's video going viral and being viewed 2.4 billion times. Each one of those clicks could range up to $6. So black death is um, a billion dollar industry. Next slide. So these are the, the effects of anti-black racism offline or outside of schools. So then I looked inside of schools. Next slide. And next slide again. <laughs> 
Um, and so essentially I did the study in a computer science classroom and I found that um, you know, there was this influx of ed tech, particularly code.org, Scratch, all of these computer science technologies. And I found overwhelmingly that the tech that was brought into the school actually had these algorithmic microaggressions that anti-blackness again was the center. So these are just some examples. Um, one is that the students had to use Scratch, which is an introductory coding platform. Um, and the Scratch at the time did not have diverse representations. And the students, instead of being able to just click on an image of a black girl and insert that into their program because there was no images, they took their own images and they uploaded them, right? Um, however, Scratch is not designed storage-wise to hold that much data, so their projects consistently crashed. So the black girls were the students who never had projects completed and they consistently got failing grades and they had a lot of emotional responses to their projects crashing while the other students were able to get easy A's, right? So a project that took the other students 10 minutes to do, my students, it took them days to no avail, right? So this is just one example. Um, they also had content moderation software in the schools that blocked problematic or unsafe content. Interestingly enough, the students who wanted to go on Taylor Swift's website, it was fine. My students, when they would try to go to BET.com um, or look up Nipsey Hussle, it was blocked, right? And every time something was blocked, it was reported to the principal and the administration as being a violation of the, the community guidelines and the behavioral guidelines. And so we saw how these systems were being used to push out students, right? At the beginning of my study, I had six students. By the end, I had four um, because two of them were expelled because they violated the digitally mediated discipline protocols. Um, and unfortunately, as you know, I mentioned the school to prison pipeline being funneled by the new gym code. So one of my students ended up in a girl gang and had early contact with the criminal injustice system and the other student experienced um, homelessness. So we can see how these technologies um, are creating intense harms for marginalized students. Next slide. This is just an image of the content moderation picture. This is what would come up if you tried to look up black digital content. Next slide. Um, and then this, this is particularly about my um, higher education research. So uh, the students, my undergrads, have to use Proctorio at our university. Um, and so we found, obviously, that Proctorio, you know, it's in the middle of a lawsuit right now, but it has a lot of uh, algorithmic biases, right? So essentially, the cameras, the image recognition systems do not recognize darker skin. So in order for students to get into the test, they have to turn on lights so that their black skin can be red, because otherwise, they're not seen as human. The algorithmic systems are designed to see human faces, so what does it mean that black students are not recognized as human, right? This goes back historically to the notion that blacks, black people are not only subhuman, they're not subhuman, they're actually unhuman, right? When we think about the legacy of slavery and how that has become encoded, algorithmically encoded into these systems. These systems are simultaneously ableist. So students, um, they use eye tracking um, devices and keystroke um, software. And so if a student is looking off the screen or moving in an abnormal way, right, the, the system flags them as being criminal or suspicious and they're often locked out of the, the, the class. It also monitors your Wi-Fi stability. And so if you are someone who is taking a test perhaps in a Starbucks or a library because you're unhoused, you would be seen as criminal. And finally, the, the machine learning algorithms in real time calculate a um, baseline, right? A normative baseline of behavior. So if you fall outside of that norm, you are also flagged as criminal. So we can see how Proctorio is creating similar um, issues of algorithmic anti-blackness that disproportionately harm our black students. Next slide. And that's it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Benjamin Harold. I'm a journalist with Education Week. I've been covering um, ed tech for about 10 years um, in schools. And uh, I say first that it is humbling to follow two such powerful presentations, and hopefully I can give a little bit of context about um, how I saw some of those issues that both Sarah and Tierra discussed showing up inside schools uh, during my um, journalistic coverage. And part of what I'd like to do is try and frame some of those specific challenges and problems and ethical dilemmas that we're hearing about in the context of two larger ideas. So one is a sense that um, technology and these issues are not something that's happening to someone else somewhere, somewhere else out there. It's something that we are all enmeshed in. And I think you know, even just our little hiccups with technology this morning help illustrate that. And if we take a second to just look around the room and realize the technology that is surrounding us and pervading our interactions right now. So 
There's the devices and phones and laptops you might be checking your email or text messages on as I talk. If we look in the corner of the room, there's um, Wi-Fi access points, cameras all around. Um, I didn't notice this until Jess was kind enough to point it out to me, but back there, that T-shaped box on top of the square, that is actually um, converting my voice into light and then back into audio waves for the hearing impaired. Um, what I'm saying now is being broadcast throughout the internet on Zoom. This is all pervading everything that we do. And the, the reality of that is that we are enmeshed in these systems, irrevocably, whether we want to be or not. And yesterday, you know, the idea came up that oh you know maybe we think about banning pub, banning phones banning devices in schools and my initial thought to that is essentially that's akin to trying to ban friendship and flirting so good luck <laughs> um, um, and the way that I increasingly you know have come to think about these technologies both in schools and for all of us uh, it's in school and out is that we're in constant relationship with it so we're perceiving the technology as it perceives us. We're acting on the technology as it acts on us. We're learning from the technology as it learns from us. And together, we're constantly making new connections and creating new layers of reality. And that's why uh, I'd like to argue that one of our most profound ethical responsibilities when it comes to digital education is ensuring that children, families, and communities have the capacity to be fully active participants in their relationship with technologies. And that's as complicated and difficult as it sounds. Next slide, please. So here's a real world example from the K-12 sector. So Sarah mentioned in her talk, Gaggle. Um, in May 19, I wrote about uh, this company, private company, that's one of numerous digital surveillance systems permeating schools. So at the time of the story, Gaggle was monitoring the digital content of nearly 5 million US school children. That meant algorithmically scanning every file, message, and class assignment that every one of those 5 million kids created, stored, or shared on their district's networks and school issue devices. So we took a deep look at, one, at Gaggle's work in one particular district, Grand Rapids, Michigan Public Schools. We looked at a single five-month period. Over that time, Gaggle scanned 183,611 student messages and files. Now, there were some very specific, immediate, tangible uh, ethical quandaries raised by that. Um, such questions as, is the slim possibility of preventing a school shooting worth dozens of kids getting flagged for hate speech because they typed the word gay? Or is the slightly more likely possibility that someone's desperate child might be identified for help before they uh, commit self-harm, is that worth one Grand Rapids student who was flagged as a potentially violent threat to her classmates because she had typed out a message saying that she had been raped and abused? Um, all the, those are both actual examples. And as thorny as those are, the thing that I actually, you know, one of the other things that I took away from this experience of kind of learning about Gaggle's actual work in school was something that a K-12 instructional technology specialist in Texas told me. So she was very clear that her, schools were, her children were very aware of this technology's presence in their lives. And that meant they had to make this kind of unrelenting, constant series of decisions about how to interact with it. For some kids, that meant they self-censored. They were given journal assignments in English class and decided not to write about things that had happened to them personally because they didn't want that subject to the filtering and scanning. For other students, it meant deciding not to charge their personal phones on a district-issued computer because it would subject them to Gaggle's filters. And what really struck me is that some students decided to communicate with the technology directly, including this student you can see here who uh, was concerned about a classmate, so opened up a Google Doc, typed every bad word she could think of, and said, please look at this child, because she wanted it to be flagged. Next slide, please. So what I'm suggesting is that everyone, from teachers to principals to state policymakers and ed tech entrepreneurs, has an ethical responsibility to help children develop informed, consensual, and healthy relationships with technology. And that's really really challenging. And to give you a sense of why, I want to tell you quickly about a ed tech company called AltSchool. Now, they've since changed their name and their business model, but back in 2016, AltSchool laid out a startling vision for where this proliferation of technology in schools might head. So what you're seeing here is a heat map. And what that was generated by AltSchool engineers by applying computer vision algorithms to uh, video footage of a classroom to determine how much time students and teachers were spending at their desks versus on read aloud rugs or moving around. At the time, AltSchool was also developing technology stacks for classrooms that contained microphones and infrared sensors to capture everything each child said and everything that they touched inside the classroom, 
wearable devices to track their heart rates and how long it had been since they last ate, and learning software that tracked every one of their clicks and keystrokes, all of which would generate multiple streams of data to be fed into the cloud and, again, subject to algorithmic ana uh, analysis. And this is a business model that we are all familiar with uh, from our online lives and even when we go shopping. Uh, retailers use the same technology to figure out what items we're picking up in a department store and how to lay out their stores. Um, and so, again, it, the question becomes, if it's this pervasive and inescapable, how do we form a healthy, productive relationship with it? Uh, next slide. So um, I'd also want to argue that it's not just the technology that's proliferating, it's the types of relationships that kids build with technology that are changing and proliferating. So I want to introduce you quickly to Jeremy Currier and Seth Stevens, the two young men you saw here. When I met them, they'd just been expelled from their public school in the Detroit suburbs. The reason? After finding a sticky note with a username and password attached to a computer in the school library, the boys discovered they could use it to access a cache of staff files. By the time uh, one of those files contained the passwords, for all 15,000 of their classmates, it was unprotected. By the time Jeremy and Seth's hack was exposed two years later, they had access to all of their teachers' grade books, email accounts, lesson plans, and test answer keys. They could control all of the district security cameras from their bedrooms. They were even using the district servers to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> As a society, we're generally accustomed to thinking about preparing kids to be educated consumers of technology. I'm old enough to remember taking typing classes when I was in middle school. We've also made a massive investment in preparing kids to work in the technology sector. But that doesn't get uh, at some of the larger focuses, larger types of relationships that I'd argue are increasingly even more important. What about preparing kids to relate with these technologies in ways that uh, support their creative expression and identity development and community improvement? What about preparing them to identify, resist, and repair some of the harms that we just heard about? What about preparing kids to become the kinds of informed citizens who can regulate a powerful technology like ChatGPT and help us manage its social fallout? And finally, and I'd argue most importantly, and borrowing an idea that Jarvis Gibbons shared with us yesterday, how do we support and prepare kids to use all of this technology in order to dream of and work toward a world that doesn't yet exist? Next slide, and this is the last I'll share with you. So the last thing I'd like to suggest is that it's not just the technologies that are proliferating, and it's not even just kids' relationships with technologies that are proliferating. It's kids themselves that are changing. And Sarah alluded to this as well, with the layers of, digital, of digital identity that kids are adding to their already complicated and constantly shifting in real life identities. This truth really hit me last Halloween. I was scrolling through Instagram, and I saw a friend's picture of her tween daughter. She dressed up to go trick-or-treating, and her costume was as her own avatar from the video game platform Roblox. In so many of the online, digital, and virtual worlds that our kids occupy, they get to experiment with being someone else, or try out a new version of themselves, or add fresh layers to the person they already are. This can be good, bad, or indifferent. But either way, this development of layered identities that span both digital and IRL realms opens a whole new set of ethical quandaries that we need to consider and take seriously if we want to be trustworthy allies. My final example is this recent story from Singapore. Two teens were arrested for exploring ISIS-themed servers on that same Roblox platform. The teens hadn't beheaded anyone, and they hadn't bombed any busy city blocks in real life, but they had done just that in the virtual world. And they spent large chunks of their time there using avatars that closely resembled themselves. I can't sit here and tell you what the most ethical response to that is, but I can tell you that as of February, both of those young teens were still being detained by Singapore State Security. Um, well, Benjamin, thank you so much for that wonderful lead-in <laughs> to my talk. Um, I'm Elizabeth Laird. I direct the Equity and Civic Technology Project at an organization called the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, like Carrie said, I want to just thank all of you for being here, especially given what we just talked about. I, I uh, didn't know that the transfer of um, power in England would uh, seem sort of small compared to what we're talking about this morning. Um, I also want to thank um, Carrie especially for moderating this session, as she mentioned, in addition to um, running a very important um, center on the third floor of this building. She is also a comedian because she said, um, I put you last because you have solutions. <laughs> so spoiler alert, 
Um, I do not. Um, I have some ideas, but what we have raised this morning will take all of us um, to figure out how we strike this balance between um, all of the tech that Ben talked about and is supporting you know, how we're here today, but also addressing some of the risks that we're also talking about as well. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so if you haven't heard of uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology, the acronym is CDT. I know in education, the last thing we need is another acronym, but it is much shorter than the full name, so I'm going to use that. Um, we are a nonprofit um, that's based in Washington, D.C. We've been around um, for almost 30 years, uh, not quite as long as FERPA, but we're getting up there. Um, and we were created around the advent of the Internet, seeing both its tremendous potential, but also realizing that we need to be just as obsessed with the ways that it could potentially limit people's opportunities or invade their privacy. And the project that I lead is specifically focused on helping public agencies strike that balance between realizing the benefits of data technology as they deliver services, especially K-12 schools, um, but also being um, just as thoughtful about the ways that technology could be misused or even limit opportunities for students. And I think as my panelists have done a wonderful job of articulating the enthusiasm around data and technology has, in many cases, gotten ahead of being just as thoughtful about the ways that it could um, potentially hurt kids. Next slide, please. Um, so here are a couple of headlines um, from uh, Benjamin's colleagues. I think you were on sabbatical when these came out. That's why it's not your byline. Um, so I want to just start with a couple of stories. Uh, on the left, um, with the green dashes, you have uh, a story about the potential of an early warning system to identify students at risk during remote learning. Um, that certainly exacerbated a lot of the types of technology that we've heard about, but there was also this awareness of how much students were struggling. And so you think, wow, wouldn't that be great if we could try and figure out who those kids are and get them the, the supports that they need? On the right, um, you also have an early warning system, but instead of identifying students who may be at risk to get them supports during remote learning, you're trying to predict who might be a future criminal, and you think, oh, bad. But if you actually think about these two stories, they have more in common than you think. They're both trying to use um, big data and analytics to identify students who are at risk. Um, they probably use a lot of the same data elements. The difference is what you're using it for and who you're giving access to. And so those aren't really questions of legalities. They're really about what do we think is right. And that's what this whole conference is about, right? It's about what is right and ethical and who gets to decide what that is. Um, next slide, please. So we did research on, is anybody here a data ethicist or work with data ethicists? No? OK, well, I'm not one, but I'm going to try and do my best to convey what they told me. Uh, we did a, a, a pretty extensive research project around looking at what does the field of data ethics have to do with education and what can we learn from it. And one of the first things that we learned is that there, no one agrees on what data ethics even is. <laughs> so we took a stab at creating um, a definition that, that we use that I want to just sort of put forward some concepts for us to think about about how we navigate some of the tough questions that have been raised. Um, one is that this is uh, an evolving field. This is not anything that we are ever going to check off our list and say, OK, we now know how to use data and technology ethically and responsibly. It is going to continue to change, and so our focus on it needs to continue to change. It also needs to be focused on the life cycle of data and technology, including whether it's used in the first place. Sometimes I think we see schools procure technology and then they figure out what they're going to do with it. It should be the reverse, right? We should have a very clear sense of what is the problem we're trying to solve and are data and technology actually positioned to do it. And then when you think about the outcomes, I think about navigating this as a sort of a two-sided coin. Um, one side of the coin around using this data technology responsibly is, is this oppor opening up opportunities for everyone? Um, in Tiara's remarks, some of those very efforts that were touted as saying this is about helping everyone actually created harm. So really having um, a wide view and thinking about, is this, are these benefits available equally? I think a lot of the work around closing the digital divide and the homework gap falls into that. At the same time, you also need to be just as obsessed that it's not having a disproportionate and negative impact on any groups of students, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and so I think we have to strike a balance and navigate both of those things. And so 
the topics that come up when you're thinking about the ethical data use um, and technology use include equity and bias. They include building capacity. They include community engagement, which Benjamin has talked about, being transparent. A lot of things that we're talking about, the community has no idea that it's even happening because schools don't have to tell anybody. Um, and then finally, it is about privacy and security, but these questions that we're wrestling with now really are much broader and bigger um, than just privacy and security. Something can be private, it can be secure, and it can still be a terrible idea. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are a range of reasons that schools should care about this. I mean, we all sort of self-selected to be at this conference, so I know to some extent I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but the benefits of, of engaging in these conversations are, one, making sure that your investments actually work. You know, are, are they achieving what they set out to do? Um, it's also really important to build trust. There are so many stories, including some that have been talked about today, when the public doesn't trust you, um, you know, they come for your data, they come for your technology, they don't want you to use it. And even if that's not compelling enough, if you don't do it, you're gonna experience backlash. And there are so many stories of schools and districts working to develop new data and technology solutions, and then, um, you know, the public finds out about it and all that hard work is, is, is um, done. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just go through a quick case study on student activity monitoring software, which has already come up, Gaggle is one company that provides these services, but is not the only one. Um, this technology really spiked um, uh, during COVID. Um, we saw schools really step up in trying to close the digital divide. Again, that ethical, um, we need to make sure the benefits are available to everyone. We probably all saw the stories about students in um, you know, a fast food parking lot trying to connect to the Wi-Fi on a shared device and how that impeded. Just forget even about like instruction, just being able to even stay in touch with their teachers. Um, so schools really stepped up and gave out devices at unprecedented levels. And so what we wanted to know is, well, what strings did those come attached with? And in particular, looking at student activity monitoring software, which is software that's installed on these devices. It can also function on personal devices. That's doing everything from tracking logins to um, monitoring you know, keywords that you're searching to actually enabling some teachers to have real-time access. And we found that this technology was just pervasive. So our most recent survey, which we reported out last year, 89% of teachers say that their school uses this type of technology. And we also wondered, is this gonna go away now that students are back in school um, in person? And the answer is no. 96% of teachers said that their schools continue to, uh, intend to continue to provide devices to students. Next slide, please. Um, so we also wanted to know, why are they using it? Um, and so we found that the two stated reasons are one, um, I see your sign, but I need another minute. <laughs> I'm gonna go rogue. I guess maybe you could play me off soon. Um, get your Spotify out. So um, we found that the two main reasons that schools say that they're using it, one is they perceive that it's legally required, but two, one that's come up in this panel already is they're doing it in theory to help students, to keep them safe, primarily safe from self-harm. They wanna be able to identify students who may be contemplating hurting themselves or perpetrating acts of mass violence, which are again in the news all too frequently now. Um, but what we found is that actually way more common and the stated purpose when you ask teachers why do you have it is for disciplinary purposes. So 70% of teachers said that we have this software in order to discipline students. Um, so it actually really diverges from its stated purpose, which is again why transparency is so important and community engagement is so important. Next slide, please. Um, we also wanted to know, well, what is the, what is the actual impact of this? Um, and so what we found is um, a number of things. One is LGBTQ plus students are um, disproportionately targeted by this. Um, almost a third of LGBTQ plus students say that they are someone they know has been outed because of this technology. And so again, when you're saying this is in the name of keeping students safe and help help with their mental health, outing students against their will to the school or even their families is certainly not in their interest and I think you could argue makes them less safe. Um, in addition to that, uh, about half of students say that they're not comfortable sharing their true thoughts and feelings online. Well, what's the problem with that? You're in an educational setting. The whole point is you express your true thoughts and feelings and you make mistakes and you learn. And so I think this finding in particular suggests that this technology may actually be undermining the very mission of our education sector. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll call out here is that 44% of teachers said that um, they know of a student who has been contacted by law enforcement because of this, and you're like, well, what is law enforcement involved? Well, think about it. These things are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How many educators do you know, although maybe higher than we would like? Uh, but most school officials are not working those hours, so when the alerts are coming in outside of traditional school hours, who's gonna respond to that? 
law enforcement. You're not paying, you know, sort of hordes of people to respond to these things after hours. So it's actually built in to the design of these things that law enforcement is involved. And then if you're not freaked out enough <laughs> at, on a Saturday morning, think about this in the context of the Dobbs decision. You already have that structure built in, algorithms in place, that these can now also be used to monitor students accessing reproductive health resources. Next slide, please. Um, uh, again, this, this theme, one of the pillars of trying to navigate this is community engagement. It's going out, it's forcing schools to tell people what you're doing, and getting meaningful input from those who are affected the most. Um, be it uh, students and their parents. And so this shows, although maybe it's too small for you to see, um, but we asked um, parents and students, do you think it's important that you're engaged? And so that first, bar, the first set of bars um, shows that they're almost all said, yes, of course it is. And then the next set of bars is the percentage of parents and students who have ever actually been engaged. So you see this huge difference between the importance of it and whether it's actually happening. And so we have extensive guidance, I will respect your sign and not go through it now, um, about what, those, uh, what meaningful engagement can look like. Um, but it is, spoiler alert, it is very hard. That's why I laughed at you, Carrie, when you said I had solutions. Um, but it is very important um, to build that in as a pillar to put guardrails around some of the uses of this data technology. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'm wrapping up. Um, the thing that I will leave you with um, is that uh, I don't. I think the choosing between the use of data and technology and mitigating some of these risks is a false choice. We can and have to do both. Um, and so I think that's the that's the the challenge ahead of us is how do we realize these benefits, but you know also serve as a, a break when the gas pedal gets ahead of. Um, us in some of these conversations. So with that, thank you. And I think now we'll shift to questions. The panel, I mean, I'm thinking in new ways, new examples in my mind. I want to I want to give you all an opportunity to process. So let's follow the tradition of what other panels did yesterday and give you time for a little pair share and maybe name to a partner, what's one thing that you heard from this panel that you hadn't known before, that you hadn't considered, or one example that stood out to you and really surprised you? OK, so we're going to take three or four minutes. All right. I'm going to bring everyone back, back to the front of the room. We're going to continue the conversation here. I love hearing the buzz. I hope your conversations were meaningful. Um, I want to ask each of the panelists here to talk to one thing you heard from another panelist that stood out to you. I can yeah, start yeah. if you like. I was really struck by what Tierra shared about the um, girls using Scratch and not being able to uh, have their own identities and experiences reflected and that kind of cascading through their experience of the project. And it really struck me as a parent of two middle schoolers myself and having a new appreciation of just how devastating those moments can really be emotionally when you can't participate in the same way that everyone else does or you don't belong in the same way that everyone else does. That's not some kind of abstract harm. That's devastating for a 12-year-old and 13-year-old. Um, and so um, I, hadn't, I had never, I wasn't aware of that with Scratch. And so seeing that and understanding that, it was like, oh, man, that's, that registered. Thank you. I mean, they were devastated, they cried, you know. Mm. Am I up? Sorry. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it was, it, it created a lot of just like socio-emotional harm, yeah. you know, outside of feelings of unbelonging. It was also just like this thing that I worked on that I loved, uh, right. crashed, you know. Um, and we also, none of us had any idea that the, that the system was doing that. I actually ended up in the middle of the night just by Googling, like, why are these projects crashing? And I ended up finding, like, a, a Reddit thread explaining, like, the storage mm. and stuff. Oh, wow. So, like, yeah, no, even the teachers were just like, we have no idea. Maybe their computers just don't work. So, yeah. Thank you for that you don't example. Know if you don't know. Um, I'll, um, I, there were so many new and, and, and really interesting and devastating insights in uh, these presentations. But I'll say one that, um, that I'll take from Ben's presentation was the, the boys who are you know, essentially criminalized for uh, being inventive. <laughs> I mean, you know, picking up some information they weren't supposed to have, but actually using um, the kinds of skills of, of makers and, uh, 
and understanding the systems that so many of us don't understand in certain ways. Um, and it just reinforced the sense that while we have sort of dumped all this technology in schools, um, we have expected students to act as consumers and, and sort of passive receptacles of this and not ask too many questions and not get into the, um, the gears, um, which was you know, an early promise of technology in schools, was to learn how to make things and learn how it works. And we've really um, almost uh, taken that piece, the genuinely educational piece, out of um, these systems for students when we treat them as uh, people who aren't supposed to get to know too much or get too far into the very systems that are shaping their lives as uh, students and human beings. I would, if I can respond just very quickly, I would say that you know, for um, Jeremy's mother in particular, that was one of the most upsetting things is, you know, as a, as a parent, she was totally unable to keep up with his aptitude and interest. It was just well beyond her. And so she would, you know, spending a lot of money to buy him computers and, that he could take apart and, you know, try and find coding camps for him and so forth because the school wasn't able to offer it. And so her hope was, well, you know, I'm going to have a child who's going to be able to work in the IT sector, which was, you know, he was pretty socially awkward, he struggled in schools in lots of other ways, and so there was a clear path for him that the school's response to it actually closed off, because now he has a criminal record and he will be un ineligible for many public sector IT jobs. Wow. I get to follow Ben again, thank you. <laughs> um, there were so many things, so just it's such an honor to be as part of this panel. Um, I was chatting to Tiara while y'all were chatting, and I said I'm gonna spoil mine and just tell you what it is. Um, I think I was really intrigued by what she spoke about in terms of um, some of the implicit bias and content moderation, um, especially along racial lines, because I think what I've seen more reporting on and I think what our research and has focused on is more along LGBTQ plus students. And one example is the school district that I graduated from in Katy, Texas. Um, made news, I see you guys shaking your head for all the wrong reasons. Um, one of the things that they did, um, well in addition to building the most expensive uh, high school football stadium in the country, <laughs> uh, they also blocked the Trevor Project for a long time, uh, their website. Um, and so we're thinking about, and actually I would love feedback from everybody, um, we're planning our next round of polling for that we'll do this summer. I already started to pick Ben's brain about it. Um, but thinking about are there, what is the experience of students and do they, do they see this bias along, you know, not just LGBTQ plus content, but also along racial lines. And then, you know, part of what I think I've seen our research do is take some of these things that can be dismissed as being theoretical or just that happened to one student, but really showing it is, um, you know, pervasive. So that's something I'll be taking away and scheduling a meeting with you about. <laughs> uh, but also welcome thoughts on, um, you know, as we talk so much about getting, lifting up parent and student voices, you know, I think that's one of the things that we try and do and, and do it in um, quantitative research that we can take to policymakers and get attention. So I'm gonna be thinking more about that and would love feedback. Can I, can I just jump in on something you just said um, about lifting up voices? Um, one of the things that's been striking to me in sort of reading around in this literature is how often students are told not to use their own voices uh, because of all the monitoring that's going on, right? Uh, ben alluded to this too. But right, not using these platforms that we have made available to them to express themselves in the ways that they would naturally express themselves because it's going to get them into trouble. And so you see this kind of um, these you know uh, digital hygiene guides, routines, right? Uh, guides to your privacy is don't actually write these things down. <laughs> uh, you know, talk to someone in person, which has um, you know has this odd effect of uh, you know not just squelching their expression, but teaching them that right. that their expression can get them into trouble yeah. um, and also a, a kind of word to them that adults will always misread what you say so don't use the kinds of jokey uh, I mean there's there are generational issues of course in this sort of use of technology and also the, the languages right that are constantly getting misread by monitors um, you know sort of off-site human content uh, <laughs> moderators right um, that, that students are using that are, that are, are foreign, really, to um, adults often and, and have this potential for getting them into trouble. So that this, you know, this, this question of expression and voice and the kinds of things that students are, that is so crucial to adolescents and, and young kids to be able to do are, are being actively, uh, you know, policed um, and um, squelched by these systems. And then I would add, just to further complicate it, 
Um, we've done some focus groups too. What we share now is the polling, but in our focus groups, we've done some with parents, and they actually, some see it as an asset. They see it as this is how we prepare kids for the workforce mm -hmm. because you're going to be tracked when you get a job. Um, so if anything, like we're preparing them for their future careers. Yeah, but is that what we want to prepare? No, I know. Them? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, and I, I, we were, yeah, we were just having a conversation. I didn't get to say my point. Um, I was just floored by all of your data. I was like, I'm citing all of this. <laughs> um, but yeah, like two things really stuck out to me. One, it was, you know, the, the, the disconnect between the stated use of technology and its actual use, which, you know, I think my work touches on, but to actually see it, you know, in data, it's like, it was really like powerful. Um, and then also the, the use of law enforcement as like backup, yeah. you know, teachers or, or it's like again we know that the the prison system or the or the prison industrial complex is very much like schools are embedded in it right um, but technology just makes it so much more obvious and and shocking so I just mm. I really appreciate all of the data thank you that was the, the 44 percent of mm -hmm. teachers saying they knew of a student who had been contacted by law enforcement and 37 percent saying we automatically forward those alerts they were I remember when they you know when our re we hire a research company to do this for us, when they showed it to us, I was like, oh my God. It's so much worse than yeah. I ever thought it would be. If I might jump in with just a quick example from the reporting in the Gaggle story. Uh, I also talked to administrators in the Evergreen Public Schools in Washington State. And just to like get examples of how does this chain work? Mm -hmm. So an alert comes in, what does the alert look like? Who responds to it? And one of the specific examples that the IT guy there talked about as happening again and again was you would see something on you know, a student's uh, Gmail, like uh, emailing another student on the network, and it would say something like, oh, uh, I want to kill myself, or I can't believe this is going to happen, or you know, like these really kind of alarming things, but you don't have any context for it. And so the, these administrators are in the position of saying, okay, do we need to call law enforcement to do a wellness check, and often doing that. And so you know, it, he, this guy was telling me a story about you know, one of these examples that had come up, and they uh, called law enforcement. It was like late on a Saturday night, and they went to the child's house and knock on the door, and the parents were like, what's going on? And it's like, it's a wellness check. We hear your child might be thinking about hurting themselves. And they're like, no, nah, I just broke up with my girlfriend. You know, and so, but you don't know. And it's, it creates all of this kind of like opens this Pandora's box of, uh, dilemmas and questions and quandaries that um, uh, are really difficult to navigate for the people who are ultimately making the decisions. Yeah. Um, that really connect, that example really connects with me and some work, and work that I do on adolescents' digital lives and really the hidden toll that young people um, experience as they witness digital cries for help in their networks. That adult, and we're talking here about adults being privy to and misinterpreting uh, content as they're monitoring student data, but there's also the reality that adolescents are witnessing their peers mm -hmm. and sometimes their close friends crying for help and feel stuck about, feel mm -hmm. tremendous dilemmas mm -hmm. about, you know, about what to do and mm -hmm. how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I want to move the, actually, let's stay with youth. Let's stay with, you know, I think it's, this, been, this has been a really interesting um, I appreciate that almost everyone in the panel has shared examples of how young people are trying um, to, to find a sense of agency um, in many of these situations. So when it comes to Scratch, they're, you know, there's not an avatar that is aligned with their racial identity, so they're, they're taking selfies. And you know, there are negative consequences that Tara laid out that come with that. Um, so students are innovating to make choices. In some cases, they're self-censoring. Um, so it's really, it's really important to tune into those decision points and really understand the perspectives of students, because that's ultimately what, what it's all about in education. And yesterday morning session, there was a really thoughtful question from a participant. Um, I can't remember which session, it was a rich day, but it really resonated with me. And it was, where is the space for student voice and educational ethics? So I want to extend that question to today's conversation. Where is the space for student voice in schools' decisions about ed tech that have clear implications for students' sense of privacy, for their future trajectories, their very sense of agency? What would it look like to bring students more into these conversations? Who wants to start? 
Another small question. I can throw out a, a big picture idea in response in that, you know, this, this framework that I've, I've tried to bring to my journalistic work of thinking about how do we cultivate informed, healthy, consensual relationships with technology. Like part of a healthy, informed, consensual relationship is you can opt out of it. You can walk away. And so part of the challenge, I think, in schools is if I say, you know, there are many parents who don't want to use Google Classroom, for example, or who don't want their child taking the, the new uh, version of the psychological surveys mm -hmm. that are intended to direct career paths and social emotional wellness and so forth. Um, but there's often harsh sanctions for that, or it's just kind of impossible. Like, you can't participate in school for that. And so I think thinking, like, kind of to the root of this question of what does it look like for a child or a family to say, I want to not use this mm -hmm. technology and making sure there's an option available for that. I was thinking about the fact that so many, I mean, it's not just schools, it's lots of institutions in uh, this society that don't actually ever get to deliberate about the systems, the technological systems that are put into place. And I wonder um, whether, I mean, the, the individual opt-in, opt-out, the amount of information you need and that, right, that whole consent regime, uh, you know, data scholars have found pretty problematic. But I wonder if building into schools uh, a kind of parent or community board and student board, right, to review new technologies coming in and to actually educate or, uh, students and parents about what the implications might be insofar as that's possible to forecast, you know, might be an interesting model. Um, there's just, I mean, we've seen this with police forces. We've seen this in so many different instances where technologies are brought in without any kind of public oversight. And, you know, if it also had a kind of educative uh, function where students could actually, right, bring it into uh, um, debate classes, and, you know, think about what the pros and cons of introducing new kinds of technologies in schools would be, you know, both a, um, something that would support their education as critical users and thinkers about technology and about their own educations, but would also, um, you know, perhaps produce better outcomes in terms of how schools, um, you know, think about these. Yeah, I really want to hear from Elizabeth as well, because I know you've collected data from youth directly. And also, Tierra, I understand that some of the work that you're doing with black girls is really about creating space for them to freedom dream, mm -hmm. abolitionist technologies. So I would love for you both to weigh in on that. And then I'm watching the time. And I hope people can approach the microphones if you have questions. But I first want to hear from Elizabeth and Tierra first. Sure. Um, your question, it, we're at Harvard. It feels like a PhD level question, and I almost want to start with just like 101 engagement. I think it would be a huge step just for schools to even tell the community what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it feels like there's so many things that would have to happen that mm -hmm. aren't happening to have the meaningful engagement that we're talking about. And then we could get into mm -hmm. the questions of mm -hmm. is consent the best model, or should mm -hmm. we just take certain uses mm -hmm. off the table? Mm -hmm. Um, but as a data point, um, one in five parents don't even know that the technology that I talked about, whether it's being used at all, forget about whether they think it's helping their kids. They, do, they definitely don't know what's being shared with law enforcement. It, and the way that they enter this conversation, it's sold to them as, as keeping students safe. And it's like, well, why? Of course. That's, yeah. Why wouldn't I want to keep students safe? And then um, you, know, you see these light bulbs go off, like, well, do you want law enforcement to have? Like, you just, so there's... So anyway, so I guess I would start like pretty basic um, and try and figure out what does meaningful transparency look like, and with engagement, you know, whether it's with students or with parents or you know other groups, these communities are not a monolith, and you don't just talk to one student and say, yep. And oftentimes, the folks who are most vocal, vocal don't actually represent the views of of the larger communities. Um. So I, so my work really focuses on preparing youth to navigate these systems and particularly subvert these systems. Um, I also do a little work with teachers. Um, so I talk a lot about like critical algorithmic literacy and how do teachers prepare their students to understand the various types of algorithmic systems that are in the school but also in their personal lives. Um, and so I've been doing some work to develop a curriculum. Um, but a lot of that work has been happening in a program that I teach in the summer um, at UCLA. It's an abolitionist AI program um, featuring 98% black students from low-income schools in, um, in Los Angeles. 
Dallas. Um, and there we actually talk about all of these issues, right? I present a, a lot of the, the, the everyday kind of manifestations of anti-black racism um, in various technologies. And the students learn about them. And they also learn about the actual socio-technical features. So we actually learn um, how to train an AI, right? How does Google image search work? Why do we have racist results in, in Google image search? Um, and by the end of the, the class, they actually design the Freedom Dream, um, an abolitionist mm. technology that they believe can dismantle some of the everyday manifestations that they've learned about in the class. So they talk about um, how do we redesign um, a social media platform where black joy is at the center, right? Mm -hmm. Where we can talk mm -hmm. about, um, you, you know, um, George Floyd in a way that doesn't uh, result in a commodification or doesn't result in us being traumatized. Like, how do we design systems that are actually made to protect us, right? Um, and, and in intersectional ways. So they basically, I guess it's, it's really, my view is I want to prepare students for technologies that are even, that haven't even come out yet, right? How do I give them the critical skills to disrupt these systems and continue to iterate on that? Um, because I don't think I single-handedly can dismantle <laughs> this apparatus. So let me prepare like the youth to do that. And how can we replicate your model? <laughs> I mean, terrific. I have no idea. <laughs> Anyone have any idea? We'll, we'll go to Q&A. Fernando. Thank you. Great for, uh, thank you for a great panel. So I, I have a question. Your presentation, particularly on surveillance and the extent to which it is used and maybe abused in institutions, brought back to memory a case here at Harvard a few years ago where the dean of students in a meeting with the residents of the student houses basically instructed them to do something that was questionable. And one of those resident deans sent the email to the newspapers, which published the story. That dean went to talk to the IT and said, I want to know who did it, and remove that person from the job. That would have been the end of the story if the student newspaper had not taken an interest and raised the question, what right does a Harvard administrator have? to read the private correspondence of individuals. Mm -hmm. And that dean was removed from the job. She's still a member of the faculty. The university never acknowledged any wrongdoing in that. End of story. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that it's probably only a matter of time until students and others begin to engage in forms of resistance. I'm thinking about fugitive pedagogy, where they actually send dumps of data to the New York Times and others saying, this is how our deans read our emails. These are the records that we keep on the mental health of students. This is how we still keep the grades of our students without adequate protection. If and when we begin to see that, what do you think are the ethics of how institutions should handle the whistleblowers? Well, I, if I could just chime in from a data perspective, we actually don't see. If you ask students, they, they also have this mentality, generally speaking, that if it keeps students safe, it's worth it. So I think there's also this education that would need to happen before we even get there. But I'll let my panelists talk about if and when we get there, what should happen. Mm. But we're not seeing it now. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by, I mean, I think the possibilities are that we have created all kinds of, and, you know, and it is um, adults, again, you know, who have created the possibilities, the structures, the contracts, the uh, systems that, uh, that students are now trying to navigate. And I think there will be instances of that kind of resistance or or simply mucking around with the gears of these systems, as you know, your, the students you profiled showed. Um, I don't. I don't know. I'm not sure how to speak in a kind of general sense to the ethics of that. You know, we have instances, of course, in sort of national security and other places where people mm -hmm. feel it's their duty to reveal um, malfeasance and. Um, and I, you know, I mean, this is maybe um, returns to here. It's you know, the sense of the. Um, you know, the critical tools that we're equipping people with, you know, as some of them are, are going to be destabilizing, <laughs> right? And are going to call attention to the very systems that, um, that you know, are, are structuring life for, um, for all of us. I'm not sure what else to say on that. I'll just say very quickly that I'm going to subvert your question just a little bit, sorry. But <laughs> instead of thinking about how institutions respond to whistleblowers, I'd like to encourage more whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and part of that is, you know, for the reporting that we did for that story, um, getting all of, like, thousands and thousands of the actual alerts through freedom of information requests mm -hmm. that you know, journalists use all the time but are certainly available to citizens as well, and including to students and teachers who may not know what of their content is being flagged. Mm 
one more provocation. I heard those were given at dinner last night. Um, we actually saw that there was higher levels of support in schools that were using this technology. So there were questions of whether it's being normalized or they become more familiar with it so they get, you know, their concerns become less. Uh, but we actually uh, thought we'd see the opposite and we did. We saw if your technology is in use, the support tends to be higher. Hi, my name is Tina. I am a graduate student at the University of Toronto. Um, I, was a, I was an elementary school teacher teaching during the pandemic when we moved online. And I taught English as a second language to grades four to grade eight. And one of the tools we used was Microsoft Teams. And a lot of the tools that were available for teachers is that you could see exactly when students logged on, how long they were on for, what time they were on, which files they opened, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a teacher, I grappled with, on the one hand, this seems very useful because there were students who I couldn't contact by phone because some students were in precarious situations, um, maybe their parents didn't speak English as a first language, et cetera. So it seemed sort of useful because I could see if they were accessing the materials, how are, how are they moving through it? And it felt, um, it felt in a way right to use the data to help inform my teaching. But then on the other hand, it also felt icky and wrong to see that you know, what my students were doing at 10 p.m. at night and um, almost a slippery slope into assumptions and, and mm -hmm. implicit bias about how my students were, were learning. So my question to you all is, what advice would you give to teachers when there isn't a clear policy around how to use, there's all this data, but there's not a clear policy on how to use this data to help inform teaching and learning? I mean, one thing is to have a policy. <laughs> so not to be glib, but I think, you know, this technology is being marketed and sold in one way. And even the use case that you're talking about is not what it was, you know, it's not necessarily how it's being. And so I think what you see is, is whether you're a teacher or a principal, like whomever, you have access to it. And then you think, well, what should I do with it? It should be the opposite, right? Like you're, you're talking about an engagement question and making sure that you're keeping track of, of students and how they're doing. Maybe technology is the right tool for that. Maybe it's not. So I think it's flipping it and starting with what is the problem we're trying to solve and then deciding whether technology is part of that. And I think it's even exacerbated on the discipline question. You said you're using this technology to keep students safe. Why is it so much more common that students are getting in trouble because of it? Mm -hmm. And I think there can be this like scope creep of, well, we started it with safety, but then your person who's in charge of truancy or whatever it is like comes down the hall or the virtual hall during remote learning and uses it for something totally different. So it does seem like there's some actions that school leaders could take around the use of it. I think the chilling effect that we're talking about and people change, that's just a feature of this. You're not gonna get away from that, but like how you use it, schools could play more of a leadership role. And honestly, companies could too. They could say, this is what our tool is used for. If we hear about using it for this other thing that it's not intended for, you're not gonna get to use our product, which they won't do, but they could. <laughs> Um, so I think there's um, definitely a more of a leadership and guidance and training role to play around appropriate uses of this and what aren't appropriate. Um, I'll hop in and say that normally um, what I do with my students, I, I invite the students into that conversation because oftentimes like teachers don't have an opportunity to opt out, right? Like this mm -hmm. is the required software and you're gonna use it. So then normally the first couple of days with my students, I'm like, let's tinker with this, let's see. So this is the software they gave me to use. Like let's actually, here's what I can see. What can you see, right? What data is being collected? We actually look up the software and we read through like the, 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 the fine print and we look up like case studies, like, you know, is gaggle racist? And then we see, obviously every single, no matter what you type in, is it racist? Like, yes, we're in America. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it, it opens the door for student agency, right? Um, and then we talk about like, how do you want me to use this, mm. right? And students will often say, okay, well, I, I understand you needing it for engagement. I, I actually do like the idea of you helping me stay on task, but I don't want you to watch me after school. Okay, this is our contract, right? Um, because it's about partnering with the students and not partnering with the institutions. Um, and I think also we talk about ethics and, and um, data ethics. How are we defining ethics? Particularly when it comes to anti-blackness or, or when it comes to racial liberation. Like that's gonna look different, right? When I talk about safety, it's gonna look different if I'm saying that racial justice is at the forefront. Um, so yeah, that's how I normally go about it. I, lo I love that. Oh, yeah. oh I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was going to no. say, I love everything you just said, and I think that is such a, a fantastic way to deal with this in the classroom. I do think there are really prior questions that we just need to be asking about what kind of information we actually want to have. Yeah. Um, 
and we don't ask it often enough, right? We assume that the information's there, more information is good, and we just have to figure out how to manage it. I think there are instances where we just don't want to have that information, and we need to figure out ways to stop the flow <laughs> of information. Often. And in part, because adults can't, in many cases, make sense of it. Like, we, there's so much we're missing and misunderstanding about what young people are sharing. Um, so I want to, mindful of the time, I want to hear questions from both sides. Um, and then um, give an opportunity for the panelists to respond to whatever aspect they'd like to. So let's start over here. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Bialystok, University of Toronto. That, that was really fascinating and, I must say, chilling. So I have a sort of naive technical question, but I think you've started to answer it, and it gets to one of the central ethical tensions here. It seems like a lot of what's going wrong now is that the algorithm is not sophisticated enough. It's too general. So for example, a student types in gay and the algorithm doesn't know the context or a student is doing a social studies project on terrorism and the algorithm thinks that they're becoming a terrorist. <clears throat> to what extent should we anticipate that the algorithm will simply become more sophisticated and be able to piece together enough data to create context? And to what extent should we wish that? Because it seems like on the one hand, we don't want these outsourced, overgeneralized AI systems to be deciding which students are a threat to themselves or others. At the same time, once they get more sophisticated, maybe that tiny bit of human interaction and oversight that currently exists will be taken out of the picture and we will have even more trust in the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Zach. Uh, I'm a PhD in philosophy at the University of Rochester, a student. Uh, my question is, I think a, a problem in this area that I worry most about that we haven't addressed, which is addiction to technology um, and shortening attention spans. I see this in my students, and I think it's a real problem. I wonder if you could comment on it. Thanks. I'll be really quick. Um, I'm just thinking about the ways in which data is a commodity, and once you have it, it's very tempting. Like, why would you give? Why would you get rid of it? Uh, so I want to know, like, whether Gaggle. I know you mentioned a bunch. I don't know anything about these 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 companies. Do they keep this data, even if they don't give it to the school? Like, even if the school no longer has access to it, do these companies keep it internally? Do you know that? Do we know that? Yeah. <laughs> And also quick question, what could we learn from uh, places like the European Union, for example, and the role of the state in protecting our data? Thank you. Are we supposed to answer all of <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I my recommendation is you pick up on the question that most resonates with what you'd like to okay. uh, Terry. Um, so I don't know if you know about Gaggle specifically, but I will just say um, at tech in general, or, or really just technology in general, um, the money maker is selling the data, data fusion centers. Um, and so the data is essentially outsourced to other industries, the, the largest consumer being law enforcement. So Gaggle might not be using the data it collects all the time, but law enforcement is. And a follow up on that, to, and to the question of you know, the advancement of the algorithms and thinking about this kind of in the structure of schools. Uh, so one example that we've seen um, is in Florida, where they've actually intentionally, willfully on a state level, integrated social media monitoring with law enforcement mm -hmm. and social services, foster youth, and so forth. And the idea is combining all of this administrative data with the social monitoring uh, data with other data allows you to ostensibly prevent harms. But again, it's more invasive. And so to the question of the algorithms developing, um, my own... My personal sense of this from having kind of watched different companies and examples is that the more powerful the algorithms get, the more powerful the dilemmas get after it. So it's kind of you're always chasing after the next problem. Um, and the, the idea that a more powerful algorithm is going to solve all the problems is, is probably pretty unlikely. And the, the, the flip side of that is that there's always a human element to it. And for schools and districts that are stretched for time and money and um, other resources, um, all of these create uh, drains on scarce resources. And so for that, there has to be someone to receive the alerts. There has to be someone to make a decision about what to do with the alerts. There has to be someone to think about how we talk about this with community and students. Um, trained on how to actually use the systems, um, to what happens when the technology goes wrong and there's an IT problem and you have to troubleshoot. So all of these things, schools often and districts often rarely think about and then realize they have this kind of powerful new tool that they don't really know how to manage or don't have the, the resources to actually manage. So uh, it, making when these questions do come up, they're uh, in a poor position to actually manage them effectively. 
Um, and I'll add on to that, that I don't think that this is an accident. I don't think these are glitches. We have to recognize that a lot of these systems this are problem. designed intentionally to do this. So it's not necessarily about having a sophi more sophisticated algorithm that can understand that gay has a context, right? It was designed to problematize and criminalize the word gay, period. Um, and we see that often. I just saw a, a reel on this this morning um, that you can ask, uh, you know, what is it, the, the little Google Dot? You can ask the Google Dot any price range, so um, about re uh, um, healthcare, right? So how much is a vasectomy? How much is um, a wisdom tooth extraction? And it'll give you an extensive verbal response. If you say how much is an abortion, she says, I don't know, hmm. right? Because that was designed. And it wasn't an accident. And so I think it's really not necessarily, again, about uh, whether or not these algorithms are programmed too simply, right? It's, it's, they're designed to do this. And there's a business model. Know, yeah, it. it's, it's, it's lucrative. I'll, did I interrupt you? I'm so no, no, sorry. No, no. Um, I think the question of that, that was the question that resonated with me the most, was the question of efficacy and our these problems tied to algorithms themselves or broader questions. One thing just to share, the company, especially with student activity monitoring software, the kind of conversation we're having about what disproportionate effects might they have, is it over or under flagging certain groups of students? Um, the four major ones are all on record as saying they've never done that analysis. Um, they had to respond to a congressional letter and they, <coughs> they all said, we haven't done it. Um, and if we had more time, I'd make you guess. The reason that they said that they had not done it was because of privacy reasons. Mm. Mm. So, you know, That's... you are tracking, you know, students 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. And like the kind of research I did, there's no reason they couldn't have done that themselves. Mm. Um, but, you know, we ended up doing it. So, and I think if you, the, the things that I tried to highlight about outing students or using it for disciplinary purposes, that's not about the algorithm. That's about your values. It's mm -hmm. about what you're, you know, trying to do with it, and there's just really not, this is true with you know, almost all third-party algorithms, which we're talking about. These are you know, created by private companies. We don't actually know mm -hmm. how they work. We don't know what bias is in them. We can guess, and I think you know, some of the research shared can in infer, um, but they're not transparent about what they're doing and how they're flagging it, much less how effective it is, although they'll give you lots of um, stories about how wonderful it is and, and all mm -hmm. these things. None of it's independently verified. There's zero evidence that this works. <laughs> and if I could jump in real quickly on the, the data retention question, which I think follows after that, I think it's important to understand and recognize and consider for both private companies and for the public sector that when that data lives, it can be used in different ways than its original intent. And a great example of this is, you know, the federal government uh, has a database tracking migrant students, and that's to provide services and supports. Um, after the 2016 election, there was tremendous concern yeah. that that data would be used for mm -hmm. other purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, any, any one of these examples you can think of, okay, if there's a different administration five years from now, they can use it for a totally mm -hmm. different end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we're, I think we're way beyond time. I just wanted to say the addiction question I think is really important. Um, and I also just anecdotally have noticed teaching college students their own recognition and, and their own practices to begin to start thinking, some of them, about how they you know, turn off uh, and get, you know, be aside from their, their phones and their tablets and everything else. And I wonder if, you know, we talked a lot about sort of youth agency and strategy, if we're gonna see a kind of, I, my hopeful note to end this on, a, a movement among youth to think about some sort of disattachment mm -hmm. from some of these um, devices yeah. and programs and platforms. I love that piece and it connects with what a variety of folks on the panel have said about, that I think amounts to the ethical responsibilities of schools to equip mm -hmm. students, young people, with not just critical digital literacies, but also um, empowering, uh, you know, their own digital habits and, you know, really, really giving them the tools to, um, to get the best out of these technologies, but mitigate some of the more problem, problematic dimensions. So thank you all for your attention this morning. Apologies for going over, but it was a very rich panel and, um, and we appreciate it. <laughs> awesome.